Uh, well, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in today. Happy Friday. Uh, this week's uh, seminar speaker is Dr. Kelsey Crane, who's currently an assistant professor at uh, Mississippi State University. Dr. Crane is a structural geologist whose research has focused on studying the tectonic evolution of Earth, Mercury, and Mars. Her research is interdisciplinary, commonly combining fieldwork, remote sensing, and modeling to study the faults and folds of mountains across the solar system. She uh, received a bachelor's degree in geology and mathematics from the University of Tennessee, a master's in geology and geoscience education from Purdue University, and a PhD in geology from the University of Georgia, which is, of course, just a short drive away. And she graduated there in 2019, and then she uh, immediately started her uh, current position at Mississippi State. And so uh, let's uh, thank, uh, thank again uh, Dr. Crane for, uh, for talking with us, and I'll let her take it away. And like I said, I'm gonna put it in the chat since uh, she can't hear us, but. Uh... All right, awesome. Okay, y'all ready? All righty. So thank you everybody for being here today. Um, we've got a, a mixed group. We've got uh, folks from Georgia Tech and then our students here from Mississippi State University. I've got my structural geology class in here with me and some of my graduate students. Uh, so this will be this will be a fun time for everyone, hopefully. <laughs> Today I want to talk to you about um, fracture networks and why they matter and investigate some links between faulting, fracturing, and finding space for life. Uh, my name is Kelsey Crane and I'm an assistant professor at Mississippi State University and the students in my group and I make up uh, the planetary structural geology and tectonics group. I chose this picture as a background slide um, to start us out because uh, this is a picture from my one of my master's student, Allison Bohannon's field area. Um, and it's a tuff, it's a felsic tuff, and it's got spaces in it for life, so fractures and vesicles. And in the, the fracture spaces here, we can see oxidization, you can see places where it's clear that uh, water has made its way into that fracture, and small vesicles, and both of those are gonna provide space um, for life, but we're gonna focus on the fractures today. So the work in this talk is gonna come from my students and I. We function as a group within our lab, so um, I do research with them instead of us all kind of doing individual things. Um, Allison is working on fault patterns in earth analog basalts, and her research is gonna make up the first part of the talk. Uh, then we've also got some work from Desiree Cunningham, who's an undergraduate, and she looks at fault zone permeabilities. So that is important for understanding fracture permeability and how fluid is able to work its way um, into fractures, especially in fault zones. And then my uh, one of my newer students, Jonathan Rich, um, he studies reactivation features on Mars with his field areas in the Wichita mountains. I do have a newest student, Lita McCullough, but um, I'm not able to highlight her work just yet. So the first thing I want to start with is emphasizing that fracture networks are abundant on every planetary surface. So I'm going to turn off um, the lights in our classroom so that for us the images get really sharp. This is an example from the central uplift of an impact crater, and the areas in white are bedrock that's exposed. And what should stand out to you in these bedrock images are these intense fracture networks. So I'm not talking about individual fractures, um, which are the opening spaces between rocks, but not necessarily implying that any slip has taken place. So we haven't really moved from fracture to fault. Fault, you would be able to measure that displacement. But here we're just looking at fracture networks. And what makes them networks, what goes beyond fracturing, is how interconnected they are. And they're typically going to be interconnected at pre predictable um, angles that are related to the stresses that caused those fracture networks. Um, so here, hold on. Sorry, someone decided to ride a motorcycle to class today. <laughs> so um, we've got this interconnected fracture network in bedrock, and that's allowed fluid 
um, to make its way through some of the larger fractures. So here the dark material is impact melt, um, and then we've got the fractures uh, exposed in that bedrock. But fracture networks can go beyond just the opening spaces and rocks. We can also fill those fractures. And so this is another example from the central uplift of an impact crater, but here we have veins that have been filled. I mean, this is another high-rise image, so this is very high resolution. Uh, this is the central peak of an impact crater that's probably about 50 kilometers across. We still see uh, bedrock that's exposed with those fracture patterns, um, but now we also see veins that are offset, that are separated due to the fractures in between. Um, and we also get a sense from this that um, the timing of fracture opening is really important, that fractures aren't just something that form once, but they're something that can open again and again um, and can act as a fluid pathway um, in space. Beyond impact cratering, planets without plate tectonics can get fractures through other processes. So even though you don't have plate tectonics necessarily on uh, Mercury or Mars or the Moon, you can still make faults and those faults are basically shearing fractures. And you can still make opening mode fractures too. So if you have a dike that's filled with magma and that dike deflates, as it deflates, the rock that's on top of it isn't supported anymore. And so it's gonna drop down relative to the uh, foot walls on both sides. And that's something that's probably happened in, in an image like this. This is a trough um, or a graben, and the, the block in the center has down dropped, leaving these sides exposed. And the exposed sides are going to indicate um, and give us hints about other fracture networks that form, not just because of tectonics or because of impacts, but because of cooling. Um, so the surfaces of other planets are primarily made up of volcanic deposits, and uh, we imagine them to be uh, flood basalts or basaltic in composition, so uh, plagioclase, olivines, pyroxenes. And just by the nature of how a basalt is extruded and then how it cools, uh, that's going to create its own fracture networks that are just unique to basalt. Uh, so here uh, you can see that there are vesicles that are going to be connected. Vesicles form on the bottom of a flow as it comes out and it hits a sharp, cold contact. Um, it's going to inflate, and so you'll have vesicles that form there. As the flow continues, that base of the flow is going to become insulated, and so you'll get more columnar jointing, and that's kind of what you can see um, here. These aren't great columns. This is from one of my field areas in eastern Washington state within the Columbia River flood basalts. Um, these are columns. Within the columns, you also have vesicles, and if you can see how those vesicles are kind of flattened and connected, um, that's also from the base of this flow getting a chance to cool. Um, the columnar jointing is, is reflecting the amount of time that that basalt had to cool, but above columnar jointing, uh, you do have differences in layers. So here you can see really well-developed de uh, columns in different layers in different uh, flows of a flood basalt. Uh, but in between, you can see these kind of broken regions. They still are relatively intact. If you hiked up to that, which I, I did through this area, uh, you can still see fracture patterns in there, and we'll look at those in a second. Uh, but they have a different character and a different connectivity than the columnar joints on either side. The other thing to notice is that because of how basalts erode, um, they make piles of talus, and the talus is relatively sharp. It's able to maintain its sharp edges in between because you have these blocks that fail so easily that essentially these, these flows don't have any tensile strength. So the rock mass itself is crumbling and falling to the base of the flow. So the talus slopes below a basalt exposure also represent opportunities for interconnected fracture networks just by the nature of the fact that they are basalt and how the basalt has failed. Um, for the interconnected middles of the flows, the entablature layers, those can be extremely fractured, and they kind of um, take on a fan shape. This one is huge. This is about 40 feet across, um, and this is just part of one of the flows that I looked at, um, and it's got a radial pattern to its cooling. This is extreme for entablature, but I think it gets across this picture of just how fractured 
basalts can be. And again, that's because of cooling. That's nothing tectonic that's happening there. And the scale of fracture networks can be extensive. So this doesn't have to be something that's local to a field area. Um, this can be something that um, spans an entire region. So this is um, Ecos Chaos and Sacrifice um, on Mars. And this is an example of how you would get a fracture network when you uh, take the, the layers that are below that, that rock that would be near the surface and you deplete those layers. You um, leave that, that rock at the surface unsupported and so it kind of rafts out. So if you're a student looking at this and you think it looks um, kind of like maybe ice that's cracked apart or uh, rafting that's taken place, um, that's kind of how this, is, how this is growing, that you've got detachment off of the edge of this intact mesa and all of these blocks are kind of sliding off and down. So the cool thing about fractures um, from an astrobiological perspective, and I am not a biologist, I am a structural geologist, but I think that this is really cool, um, is that fractures provide a safe space for endoliths, for extremophiles that live inside of rocks. And specifically for chasmal endoliths, the, the, um, the cyanobacteria and the lichen and the different forms of life that are able to make their way down inside of the fractures. And, we know this because um, these little features have been studied in planetary climate analog locations, so places that feel like other planets, like really dry areas like the Atacama Desert, or really cold and dry areas like the Antarctic Dry Valleys. Uh, but we also know that they have been studied and observed in planetary geologic analog locations, like impact craters um, that have been fractured in places like Devon Island, um, and fractured and vesicular basalts, that when you find these fractures, that like cyanobacteria um, here, colonization has taken place within a rhyolite, and then so a volcanic rock, and then you have deposition of, let's say, gypsum or halite, some kind of transparent uh, mineral on top that allows photosynthesis to continue, but you're sheltered inside of a fracture. So, the emphasis can't just be on having a fracture. It is not enough just to have a fracture. You need that fracture space to be well connected in order to support the, the endoliths and chasmoendoliths. So you can make, or you can have fluid that goes down into a fracture, but you also need fluid circulate, circulation. So the amount of time that um, biological activity can take place in a fracture is going to be limited by the amount of time that it stays open You have that space, but the amount of time that the network of them also stays open so that you keep that circulation going. Um, it provides deep shelter from radiation if those fractures are subaerial or, or um, not below water for the students. Um, also that fractures reduce the amount of evaporation that takes place. If you are in a really dry area, but you can get yourself deep inside of a fracture and water is down in that fracture with you is less likely to evaporate deep within those fracture networks. And also that the fracture connectivity allows for nutrient and nutrient circulation. So this is the same idea. If you have your fractures open, that you're allowing that fluid to carry the nutrients through. Beyond that, fracture surfaces, if you think about any shear that's gonna take place on that fracture surface, you're gonna grind that rock against itself. And that grinding of the rock against itself, especially in a basalt that's loaded with magnesium and iron, that is gonna create more nutrients and release nutrients into that system um, for the endoliths living there. So this is just an example of how um, a connected fracture network might look on Mars. We've got the atmosphere, cryosphere, so this is uh, frozen spaces between rocks and below that an aquifer, and you have cycling in that aquifer with heat flow coming from depth. That can just be regular geotherm on Mars, or if you think about maybe a space above fracturing or above a fault that's taking place, if you have two surfaces of a fault rubbed together, you're gonna have some frictional heating. And so that fracture space and the fracture connectivity and the actual shearing that's happening is gonna provide uh, heat to that aquifer and keep that cycle and the convection going. Within that cycling system, the interconnected fracture networks, 
might consist of tops and bottoms of the flow that are vesicular from when they, the vesicles cooled and expanded. Your columnar basalt uh, might have mostly vertical fractures, but I've also seen this fracture across. You go into your entablature layer, which are more arcuate and interconnected. And then your surface layer of fractures that are um, higher fracture densities and also more connected. So we want to find these places where it's not just about having the fractures, but it's about having them well connected. And we want to, in particular, when we get to those fractures, observe fossil uh, fossils, whether they are infilled fossils, so they don't have their original mineralogy, or whether they do have that, um, morphological fossils, alteration minerals, and textures that are indicative of biological activity. So if I have uh, you know, biological activity within a fracture, what are the minerals that it's using or making, um, and can we detect those? The problem is that we can't see this, or we, we can't see it from high-rise imagery, yeah, so even the highest resolution imagery that would be from orbit, we're not going to be able to see fossils. And if you're a rover, and you are, not to personify a rover, but you're moving around on the surface, You've got to make a decision or have someone make a decision for you about where to go and you have limited resources right so you have to have a way to prioritize where you are going to target your time so this is where fracture networks being abundant is really cool and because they are visible from space they're visible from space they're visible from the rover's perspective um, so if fracture networks are abundant but fossilized evidence is going to be below data resolution. How do we prioritize fracture networks that are going to give us the greatest opportunity to find preserved biological signatures? Okay, So what can we see that will best point us toward what we want to see? Does that make sense? Cool. And that's where Earth analogs come um, in handy. So here, this is an Earth analog. Uh, in southeastern Oregon, this is where we're going to start talking about the research. And the fundamental assumption here for this work is going to be that the roots of sage and other plants, which we are not saying live on Mars at all, that the roots of these plants are going to require the same basic supports as endoliths, that they need well-connected fracture systems, that they need access to water and access to nutrients in order to thrive. If we make that assumption, then we can connect slope morphology, where we can observe and measure vegetation um, with a hyperspectral camera. We can measure morphology, we can measure aspects of that surface that would be visible from high rise, and we can link that to the abundance of vegetation and the abundance of biological activity within that fracture network. So this is the type of landform that we're going to target uh, today at the start of this talk. This is a normal fault scarp. So the block that I'm standing on is the downdrop hanging wall. That's the foot wall in the distance. The rocks that you see, that stratigraphy that's dark and brown and red, those are layered flood basalts of the Steens Mountain flood basalt sequence. And then the rocks that you kind of see streaming off of the edge, that's the talus slope, where as that normal fault grew, its scarp developed and it shed material off, um, creating that talus. And these blocks that you see down here are just some of the representation of what might be up on that talus slope. The talus slopes themselves are a little bit different um, than just standing on top of the hanging wall block, uh, but this is kind of the same idea, that you're going to have um, sharp pieces and different sizes of blocks up there. Okay, so this is uh, a zoomed out context picture from this field area. This is Steens Mountain. It is a really high mountain. It creates um, a, a rain shadow for the Alvord Desert and the Sheep's Head Mountains below it. Um, this is my student Allison's field area. And here you can see multiple different cross-cutting sets of fractures, some that are straight and uh, cross-cutting sets of faults, and some that are arcuate. We've got these really light areas that are Playa Lakes. And all of this, again, is volcanic. There is a diversity of volcanics, but mostly in the field area that we're going to be looking at down here, it's all basalt. So in this area, we've got about 16 million years of volcanism and tectonism that we get to look at, and this is actually really important for getting a diversity 
of SCART morphology for us to be able to figure out which variables, which aspects of morphology are going to relate most closely to the biological abundance. So here you've got the oldest faults running northwest to southeast. Um, they're going to look a little bit fainter. Those faults are probably closer to 16 million years old. They're related to the Brothers Fault System, and they predate just a little bit basin and range extension. Um, the rest of these faults are going to be active from around 15 million years, with basin and range extension reaching this area around 10 million years ago. So that's when the Steens Mountain Fault, this one over here, and the faults that are parallel to it became active. And then you have your youngest uh, set of fault systems that are these arcuate systems right here, and those are potentially associated with a caldera um, that collapsed in the middle. Yeah, it's really cool. So you've got this caldera that is collapsing from volcanic activity, and it's making these arcuate fractures, and those are going to be really young. So we've got a range of ages here. We've got a range of orientations. So we're able to study, like, not just um, the faults themselves, but their orientation to the sun so that we can kind of take that variable out um, at the end if we were to think maybe maybe sunlight is playing a higher role in SAGE than, than the subsurface uh, factors that are going to come in. Um, but also what we can see here is that there are playa lakes in this field area. So we uh, located the mapped springs and seeps and playa lakes because there are hot springs um, that are through this field area. All of the blocks have relatively similar elevations. So they're all maybe rooting down to the same weak layer. But again, because they all have different ages, we're seeing different morphologies associated with the development of these scarps. And we can measure those morphologies both qualitatively and quantitatively. So here we're looking at the quality of the fault surface, that there are some faults where the entire fault surface is exposed, that if you climb up to the edge of this, you're not getting any talus that's developed off of this thing. It's just all uh, basalt flows. And that range goes all the way to something that is 100% talus surface, where there's no exposed fault surface anymore, and all you have left is this eroded uh, slope. And then faults that are right in between, where you've got 50% of that fault surface covered up by talus and 50% that's exposed. We can talk about the consistency of that exposure. So if you have a consistent flow or a consistent fault surface, then we can see flows throughout the entire thing, and it's not uh, sectioned off in any piece. Whereas if we go to inconsistent exposures, these are ones where, um, as Allison and I walked down um, these fault surfaces, you see kind of a splotchier appearance of the exposed fault surface. And we can also look at the sorting and size of talus. So whether you have a well-sorted talus or a poorly sorted talus, um, where you've got boulders with smaller pieces and cobbles in between, and well-sorted where everything is, is more or less the same size. Just to be clear, um, we mapped 92 faults in this area, and we walked all of this. So, um, so we walked, <laughs> and it was hot uh, and extremely dry. Um, so we did, we walked across all of these fault surfaces and all the talus surfaces uh, so that we could see uh, fault by fault uh, what we were actually measuring and making sure that we, even though these are uh, qualitative observations, that we felt really good and really certain about what we were, what we were observing. We also measured uh, quantitative aspects of structure. So we, we used an app on our phones called a Field Move Clino, and using that app, we were able to measure the strikes and dips of different aspects of each fault surface. So we could measure the strike and dip, AKA the orientation and how steep um, the fault surface was. We did the same thing for the talus slopes. We did the same thing for the bedding planes. And to, to do this and to be more certain about what we were actually measuring, you kind of have to position yourself with your shoulders square to the length, to the orientation of the outcrop. And that way you're not getting what we would call an apparent dip. You're actually positioning yourself along strike and getting a, a good estimation for each outcrop. You can't not estimate this with basalt. Uh, just because it is so erosive and the surfaces are so irregular from cooling, 
um, using a brunton and taking a traditional measurement of strike and dip with basalt uh, does not work like it would with a sedimentary rock. The area in black with the dashes is our field area and the lines that are in red are the faults. These are the 92 faults that, uh, that we measured and all of the starred areas are the seeps and springs that are here and the areas in blue are the playas. So this is kind of the third aspect of measurement that can take place in GIS after we come back from the field are things like the lengths of the faults and their distance from the playas, their distance from the hot springs. Because if you think about nutrients and where these, where the vegetation on this outcrop is getting its nutrients, it's not just from um, the basalt that it's in grinding away, it's also because there are these really intense dust storms um, and wind storms in the afternoon that blow this material from the hot springs, because there's kind of crusty mineralization on there, that blow the material from the hot springs up onto the sides of the outcrops and that carry material from the playa lakes onto the sides of the outcrops too. Now, that's great, that's all of our descriptions, but we have to be able to measure the amount of vegetation on each outcrop, and it needs to be outcrop specific. Uh, so to do that, we used a pixel cam, six band multi-spectral camera, um, and so just think about it, if you're one of the students in here, here's what I'm trying to say with this. Um, this camera works just like your eye, it can see into the visible, um, and it can see red, green, blue, but it also sees into the infrared. And specifically, when it sees into the infrared, we had this camera set so that each of these infrared bands, each of the different colors of infrared that it could see were aligned with the mast cam Z tool that's on Mars. So when you see a picture from this camera, it's not just red, green, blue. It wouldn't just be, for example, a picture of this room. It would be a picture of this room, but you could change color to represent different things. So I could change my colors to represent the infrared instead, and specifically to let you see it the same way that we would see an image from Mars, um, from the Perseverance rover. So this is what that camera looks like. We can position it so that we get shots of the whole outcrop. Um, we take the picture in the field, and this is a, a field camera, so it is meant to be used like this. And then when we come back, we can use ARC and a normalized difference vegetation index um, to calculate the vegetation indices for each of these outcrops, specifically the, the fault surfaces that are preserved and the talus surfaces. Now, this isn't so that we can take one surface and say how different is the, the fault surface versus the talus surface, but it's so that we can take all of the talus surfaces separately and say what aspects of these talus surfaces make them really likely to support vegetation and which aspects of these fault surfaces separately make them really likely to support vegetation. By considering these things separately, we then get to build our ideal surface to go hunting for on Mars. So that's, so sorry, so that's what's happening here. We've separated out the, uh, the fault surface and the talus surface, and this grayscale image is indicating NDVI. Then we use some stats. So we use backwards selection modeling to decide what variables, what of those morphologic variables do we measure in the field that are going to best predict high, high NDVIs, most vegetation. So we might start with a full model and say every variable we measured is important for us to understand high NDVI values. But that's not true. Not every variable is gonna be important for giving you vegetation, okay? So what we do is take out the ones that are the least important. We take out the ones with the highest p-value. And so our next model we run might only have four variables in it. Then we take out ones that are the least important. And what we do is we find a stopping point where the only things left in the model, the only morphological variables we see, are the ones that are important for high vegetation indices. So think about this as like maximizing R-squared. You're maximizing your fit uh, between the variables you, you measured and the high NDVI. And so these are our results. Our normalized R squareds are between 0.1 and 0.2, which if you know about statistics, it's gonna feel low to you, that's okay. Um, it's gonna feel low because it's field work and because 
we have such a wide range of variables and because some of them started qualitative and then became rank variables instead of continuous ones, that's just fine. On the x-axis, these are the measured NDVIs. And on the y-axis here, this is for uh, what's predicted from our model. So think about it like this. If your model is really accurately predicting what you saw in the field, you should have all these points hugging that, that red line right there because it would have a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. Uh, but here we do see spread across these two groups, and that's okay um, because we do overall see these upward trends. For faults, the variables that are important are that the bedding so not the actual fault and not the talus, but the individual columns, the flows as they came out, that those beddings are striking or trending northwest, southeast, that the talus is going to be poorly sorted, that um, these are located close to playas, that we have large average talus size, um, that the faults are steeper, and that those faults, even though they're steep, they're less exposed. For talus slope, bedding also is important. Having poorly sorted talus is important, being close to playas. Having larger fault talus or average talus size, faults with northeast southwest strike, and a less exposed fault surface. So, this is cool because these are things that we can see from space. Or, worst case scenario, we can see if we're a rover looking around on the surface, okay? Measuring bedding is something that you can do from a high-rise image. Poorly sorted talus, especially if some of it is boulder size, if it's 75 centimeters or greater, you're going to be able to see some of that uh, from high-rise, but certainly if you are viewing it from perseverance, you're going to be able to see that. Locating yourself close to playas or close to hot springs, we have features that we can interpret um, as those landforms, and so we would be able to, to measure those distances. Having a, uh, a steeper fault slope. Fault slope is something that you can measure with aspect in ARC. Um, and then having that percent of exposed fault surface versus talus surface, you can also measure that in, um, in ArcGIS. So this is great. What we've done is said, let's take vegetation that we cannot, or biological activity that would be really hard to measure from space, and let's take all of these variables we can, and we're going to relate those two. So we did that successfully here. And that lets us put together this ideal model for what this feature would look like. Okay, so here we've got a fault scarp. And again, for planetary stuff, this doesn't have to be a fault scarp. This could be the edge of an impact crater. But we want to have bedding that's kind of tilted, that's not exactly striking or trending the same direction as this fault. We want to have uh, some uh, larger boulders and poor sorting on that talus surface. Um, and we want to make sure that, again, that we're uh, poorly sorting that talus. Now, we can also kind of interpret this backwards. We can try to say, what about this model tells us that those interconnected fracture networks are important, and see if we can learn anything additionally about those fracture networks. So here, for example, if we try to look at all these variables and say, what do they mean? What is the actual meaning of all these things combined? Well, here we can say that one, fault maturity matters. So the understanding this fault strike and that we need the faults to have uh, been more developed so they're less exposed. Being a less exposed fault surface means that you have built up that talus slope over time, right? So these are mature faults. They have, and that means a well-connected fracture network. The other thing is that the bedding striking this orientation means that you've juxtaposed that bedding and the exposed fault surface at different angles to each other. So you're not creating the space of just aligned fractures. You're saying it's necessary for them to intersect each other. Okay, so that's giving you a connected flow path. And then that they need to be um, supported by some kind of mineralization. And this is an example of a mineralization deposit from, from minerals that were blown up off of the playa. The other thing about having a well-connected fracture network is that the fractures have to stay open. And so this is where, uh, if you see a larger average talus size, and you see a poorly sorted talus, 
students who are in SEDSTRAT, you should be seeing poorly sorted and thinking, I'm close to my source and I'm active, okay? So that's telling you these faults are active, they're growing, they're mature, but they they have a continued lifespan, and that means that they are keeping their fractures open, and that's important for maintaining that circulation. So from a structural perspective, this study is telling us how important it is for fractures to be connected and open, and biological studies have said the same thing, that basically if you mineralize a fracture, you block off a pathway. It looks kind of gooey in there, that's fault gouge, uh, where this fault has been weathered and it's had so much fluid in it over time that that clay has sealed that off. This is not going to be very permeable. And here you've got a, um, an intermediate uh, brittle ductal shear zone, so also a fault, uh, and it has mineralization in it. That's going to limit the ability for any fluid to move through those. If those fractures had been open, fluid could have come in. It did. That's how that mineralization got there, but now it's closed off. So it's important not just to be active, but potentially to be reactivated. Reactivation is important because it may provide a means for the mobility of fluids and other volatiles um, in the form of pathways. Make a crack, keep it open, fluid moves through it. And so for uh, some planets that only have thrust fault related landforms, think about Mercury, it's shrunk a bunch, its surface is absolutely coated in thrust fault related landforms, the only pathways for volatiles to make it to the surface in a lithosphere that's otherwise just tight and, and shortening constantly is going to be when you open up some kind of, of crack, some kind of fracture network to let material make it to the surface. And that can happen in the hinge zones of folds. Uh, so this is a normal fault that formed when a, um, an anticline stretched and extended within its hinge, and that lets that material have pathways to the surface. Pathways are going to be really critical, again, on planets that otherwise are only horizontally compressive. Okay? So again, for Mercury, or maybe more recently for some of the areas on Mars, if this is an area that's only shrinking, we have to have pathways to the surface to get things like volcanics um, up to the surface. And so this is an example of some of our work um, in southeastern Oregon, again, uh, and eastern Washington, where this is an area of thrust fault related landforms of fold and thrust belts shortening that terrain. But at the same time, we've had large amounts of volcanism be able to come through and specifically uh, come through through cracks in the rock. Now, if you put that much heat into a rock system, then you're going to be allowing even more of a, a means for frictional heating, therefore raising an aquifer depth, a depth, thinning the cryosphere, and generating additional surface area, so more spots for um, life to exist. So this is an example of a map that I made for Mercury, where we've got thrust fault related landforms at every crazy orientation that you can imagine. If you have a planet that's not tectonically super active anymore, it is going to be really hard for you to make a new fault. Okay? So my structure students are going to be so happy to see a more circle right now. Uh, we, we've got sigma 3 and sigma 1, and we've got these two different lines right here. This top line is more Coulomb frictional criteria. So what are my combinations of normal stresses and shear stresses that need to make a new fault? Right? And then this one that's lower down, I've lost my cohesion. Maybe I'm a little bit shallower in slope. Now I've got a whole range of faults that can be reactivated. So on a planet that used to be tectonically active, I can look at those faults and say, it's all right if I don't have huge stresses. I don't need as big of stresses to make faults anymore because I don't have to make new faults. I'm allowed to reactivate these old faults. So I'm allowed to take these awesome extensive networks of fractures and rub them against each other and make new frictional heating and that's going to potentially allow me to produce new fluids, right? To melt some ice. Uh, and so that's where our group is going now. 
we're going to be, this is uh, the MOVE software that we use for modeling in the lab, and has also been used by Herrero Gill et al. in 2020. And this is a, a thrust fault from Mars called Ojigus Rupus. And Ojigus Rupus is special because it's one of a few thrust fault related landforms. So think folds, right? Folds and a thrust underneath that has evidence for water that's drained out of its hinge zone. It has channels coming off from its high point. And that's not from rain. If it were from rain, then every other high point around it that's about the same age would also have those channels. These are special. Um, and it's because we think the joints that opened up when this thing was folding rubbed against each other, produced frictional heating, and melted some of that cryosphere. So thrust fault related landforms uh, looking around their hinges, that could be a a profitable place to start looking for places uh, of biological evidence. Because you know that there's been heat there, you know that you have access to fluid, and when we look at landforms that are this big, it's hard to tell how big this is in this picture, this isn't a one-shot deal. This is a landform that's been potentially reactivated over millions of years. So think about it. you've made a habitat now, you've made a, a fracture network that's connected that you get to keep open and hot for millions of years. That seems like a pretty good spot to, to for worst case scenario, we get good structure data. <laughs> Best case scenario, biologists are happy. Uh, so another area that our group is going down, um, and I'll end in this, is the limitations of reactivation. Uh, for other planets. Uh, understanding the limits of reactivation is going to be important for constraining that fluid production and pathway production. So when can reactivation stop? Okay, Because if it turns out reactivation stopped a long, long time ago, finding preserved biological activity in a hanging wall may not be our best bet. But if we find that reactivation is likely and still happening, then this could be more fruitful. So one of my newer students, John Rich, is working in the Wichita's, and he's done his field work there on um, some places that represent intracontinental deformation. So think continent-continent collision, but then think not just happening once, okay? So if you imagine building the Appalachians, um, the Appalachians actually has like a weird tail, okay? So running from the northeast um, in Newfoundland and in Canada. Imagine that chain of mountains running all the way down to Georgia, but its secret tail is swinging west into Alabama, and then it tucks below the surface. So we're in Mississippi right now. We actually have hidden Appalachians underneath us. They pop back up in Arkansas. They go back underground, and then they pop back up again in Texas. And so the tail that's swimming through underground when it comes back up in Arkansas, we call it the Wichita's. When it pops back up in Texas, we call it the Marathon. Um, and it's all related to Pangea coming together. So you don't just make Pangea crunch everything together and stop. That pressure and then stresses continue. And so we potentially have reactivation um, that's happening in the Wichita's. So this is a good place to look for intracontinental deformation uh, where that's happened uh, multiple times. And what we can do is we can look at structures there and we can think about their scale, we can think about their geometry, what features we see on them. Um, so for John in particular, this is a, an anticline that he reconstructed from some field work in this area. Um, and we can locate normal faults uh, cutting the outside of this uh, of this anticline, and we did. We've we've actually almost exclusively only found normal faults, even though the larger structure um, is indicating shortening. And so this is where we're going to be continuing. We've got uh, each of these little circles are pieces of structural data that we've co collected across this landscape, and so we're going to be connecting this larger structure. Um, he makes cross sections, and we can thread those together. So this summer. Uh, we should have a full 3D model uh, reconstructed of what the surface used to look like. So in summary, one, fracture networks are abundant. They provide space and pathways for life, and they do us a big favor 
because we can see them, we can measure their connectivity from space. And by doing that, and by, by being able to prioritize the morphologies and the features that we can recognize associated with connectivity, then we can target areas that have the best chance for preserving biological evidence um, and activity. So that means targeting connected, open fracture networks. And we can also learn that keeping the fractures open is critical for allowing fluid and nutrient circulation and that reactivation is probably key in, um, in keeping those fractures open. And we can learn about reactivation and keeping fractures open through more field work. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for that talk. For everybody who can hear me thank, on our um, side. Thank you, Vertech, for letting me uh, talk today, and thanks for being cool with my students coming. <laughs>